So welcome I'm everybody. Sure Happy we start Thursday. This. Perfect. <laughs> So we're very excited today because on this In Focus with Danny, we have a very special guest, um, Jason Kubasek. So I hope you're as excited as I am to hear what he has to share with us. And with no further ado, I am leaving the floor to these gentlemen and sharing the disclaimer quickly first so that you know that the opinions expressed on this webinar does not reflect those of Digital LLC and their subsidiaries, nor those of Digital Business Lounge. Although it's weird to say this when Jason is here, <laughs> <laughs> but I, they will speak from their heart. There you go. The floor is all yours, gentlemen. Love it. Love it. That was very formal, Curls, and we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. The slide is mainly for me and all the, all the stuff that I say. Jason. Thank you for joining us, brother. It is uh, it is good to have you here, man. Are you are you at the the place in Toronto that um, right around the corner from where we did the brand incubator? Yes, and yes, yes, I am. I'm um, about a thirty second walk from where you and I had our little chat there outside of the venue at the uh, the brand incubator uh, workshops. So I was just thinking about that this morning, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I put that up. I generally put a little post out there each week to remind people of the call. And I stuck out the, the interview uh, where, where I, I called you outside, man. You were kind enough to come come hang out with me. So it's good to be here, man. I uh, Yeah, I actually remember we had our pictures taken downstairs. So we were at Brand Incubator. They had a photographer and they were uh, we were going around the corner and she's like, we're going to set up and take your pictures here. And I was like, where are we? This is Jay and Steph's house. I'm like, cool. <laughs> Yeah, it was so, right here in the right yeah. here in this room, actually. Yeah, so That's it looks right. a little messy, but it's uh, not, it's not not too messy. It just looks a little messy, but uh, yeah, all the snowboards along the side there. That's where uh, we had the the panel set up and the photography was taking place. So excellent, good stuff. Excellent. Well, thank you for making the time. I know that you're busy. I know there's uh, a million things that are that are going on with with launch you and everything that's uh that's happening right now so thank you for making the time to come hang out with the cool kids man we appreciate it so uh what we do here uh we have topics every couple weeks uh and then we interviewed uh, a couple folks and the people really enjoyed it so uh they voted since this is you know this is their call they just you know let me talk um to have somebody to interview every other time. So uh, a lot of people knew who you were, right? So they were like, you should, you should get this guy. Um, so thank you for making the time, brother. So some of these questions uh, we ask everybody. Uh, some of these questions are specific to you. Some questions people send me. Um, you know, as always, if, if you don't like any of them, just email curls, she will get you sorted. That's, that's how we do it here. We just basically put all the responsibility on her. And it's worked out really well so far. So first question. Um, on a visionary call a little while ago, I heard you were talking about running every day. And you said uh, running every day was something that, you know, Jay couldn't do, but, but Jason can. And I wanted to, I, I think I have an idea of, of what you meant about it, but I'd like, I'd like to hear it in your words. And um are, is, are we all to call you Jason now? Like I would like to be proper, right? So uh, I just love to find out like, A, what are we calling you? And B, um, why, the, why the switch, man? Okay, so there's, there's a whole bunch there. Uh, so why don't we start with the uh, Jason versus J? As you can see in my um, profile uh, there, it says Jason, I still go by J. I mean, th there are a lot of, a lot, not a lot, but there, there are there are there are plenty of people who flat out said to me, "I'll never call you anything but Jay," because that's how, that's all I know you. And I just laughed because I'm like, "That's perfectly fine with me." Um, it really, it, it's not a name change. It's more I'm a Jason. So Jason is my real name. That's my birth name. And in, in my childhood, my youth uh, as a teenager, up into my early twenties, I went exclusively by Jason. And it was when I left the religious commune where I grew up and I started over, started a new life, the age of 24. Um, 
leading up to that, I would say, in the, the, the few years leading up to that, I started referring to myself as, as Jay. And I would say maybe, I don't know, let's just say half the people in my life. And it was a relatively small circle because like I said, I grew up on this religious commune. It was, it was about 15 families and we were pretty much isolated and, and confined to, to that group. So I'd say about half the people called me uh, Jay, half the people called me Jason. So, but when I left, um, I started signing my name as Jay and I just, it was, it, it was a way of um, starting a new chapter with a new identity. And the new identity that I was assuming in this new chapter was one where I was pretending that the past didn't exist. I was pretending that I had always been Jay and I, because I was embarrassed of my past. I was ashamed of my past. I was ashamed of what happened to me, uh, you know, the abuse and of you know, emotional and physical and uh, physical sexual abuse and things like that. And it was like really, I, I wanted to leave all of that behind, right? So um, I started this life as Jay and for years, I never talked about my story, never talked about my past. And I, pre I just pretended to, to be somebody who I, yeah, just somebody else. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you guys, you, you know, you, you, can, you can relate to that. Um, so fast forward now, you know, from there to I'll be 44 this summer. So it'll be 20 years uh, this summer that I, that I left. I've kind of come full circle. And by that, I mean, I've come, I've come into full acceptance of who I am. And what makes me who I am, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, there's no running from your past. I mean, you can run and hide and pretend for, for so long, but ultimately um, we've got to deal with you know, the reality. So there was a series of events that happened earlier this year, towards the end of last year, I lost a very, very influential person in my life who was a mentor of mine for about five years, who actually helped me transition off of this commune out into the, the real world. And um, he died unexpectedly just before Christmas this past year. And then, um, you know, there was a few other things. My brother um, became ill and... Uh, and he had, my brother had a stroke unexpectedly. And there was a, a few things that happened that just kind of shook me, shook me up and made me really look at my life and, and the arc of my life. And, you know, the, the, the fact that I'm at, you know, the approximately the midpoint of my life. And that's, that's when I decided to essentially invite everyone to call me by my real name. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't call me Kuba. I, I like Kuba is a, as, a, 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 as a nickname. People call me that, have called me that for years. Um, you can call me Jay, you can call me Jason. Honestly, it doesn't really, because I'm so used to being called both. Danny, it doesn't, one or the other, doesn't really feel any different to me, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, it's all merged into I'm, you know, so I'm, yeah. So I'm, I'm but here's the way I described it to someone the other day. I said, you know, those who are the very, very closest to me, like closest family, I would say, like Stephanie, my kids, um, if they ever call me by my first, you know, by my, uh, by my name, it's, it's Jason, uh, sometimes Jay, but, you know, and it's, so it's, it's like I'm inviting the rest of the world to call me what, the, the most valuable, the most precious, the most um, intimately connected people in my life have always called me. So it's more of an invitation to, to know me by my real name versus a name change per se. So hopefully that, that makes sense. Was that, does that give you some clarity on the name? Perfect, man. No, that, that makes perfect sense. You know, and the, uh, the, per the person that you that you refer to right like since you've had this this acceptance and this ownership of the past and not try to avoid it and all that that's 
that's the only person I've known. Right. So, so when I got here, like I, I met you in, in Toronto when you were vulnerable and, and talking about these things. And um, so I think that's cool, man. Cause I know that takes a lot of work. So prop, props to it's, you, you know, it, it was, I would say it's about a three year journey that cul it culminated with, with, that yeah, it was about a three-year journey. M me moving back to Toronto, really, um, is is where this yeah a, a three-year journey of self-discovery where I, I went back through you know my entire life and looked at everything it, it really in with 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 the, with the desire to to get clear on really or more clear on on who i who i am and why i am the way i am and what what my calling and my my purpose is here on this on this earth now you you kind of when you asked that question you kind of folded it in with the the running i forget now just make, make it easy for me if you don't mind um and just feed me the questions one by one but uh if you want to do you want to follow that with a follow-up question yeah 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 so um, I'm not sure if I answered everything from the, cause there was a few things told, kind of, uh, you, you absolutely did, brother. You were just talking about running when I had heard you, uh, say that, you know, Jay can't, Jason can, um, but I know, are you still committed to running every day? Is that, and if so, what's your, yeah, so that was you know? an April thing, um, mm -hmm. for the month of April. I also didn't, uh, you know, no alcohol, uh, made some other lifestyle, um, adjustments and, the so what I meant by that is you know Jay couldn't but Jason can is uh, Jay you know when I say that when I refer to myself as that it's kind of weird and, and, and refer to myself in third person but the old me um, give more credence and more uh, more uh, power to my stories about myself what was possible. Um, and you know what you know what was possible what what wasn't possible what uh it's just a lot of limiting beliefs associated with that identity and by identifying with, with jason and, and identifying as being this kid who you know when i identified myself as being jason being a kid where the the world was potentially my playground uh, even though I couldn't experience any of the things in the outside world that that the, the the worldly kids or the kids on the outside of this religious compound could experience, uh, there was a point in my childhood where where you know I would fantasize and dream about being a fighter pilot or being a baseball a professional baseball player. Um, my dream is to be a professional professional baseball pitcher. Uh, or to be a farmer like my dad, and uh, really this mind of this uh, this identity of anything you want, anything you can conceive, you can achieve, anything is possible. I wanted to get back to that, and and shatter some of the old paradigms that had me feeling like I was like I was like I was stuck and stagnant, not not growing as much or as uh, as quickly as I as I could be growing. So that's what I meant by so I wanted to prove to myself that I could actually do it. And I always had this story that, well, I needed you know a day or two or three or four in between runs. And I've never I've never been like a competitive runner or anything like that. I've always done it just because I like how it makes me feel. There's just something about going just going out and just turning off your mind. And listening to music and just just having this meditative, repetitive um, thing that that just leaves you feeling just uh, energized and fresh. And it's all for some reason running has always done that for me. So I've been using this um, this identity, identifying with you know, identifies Jason as the whole, the complete, the one that can do anything. Um, and not the one who was trying to be somebody else or trying to, or, not that I was ever trying to be someone else, but I wasn't fully embracing 
who I am. I've always been really tough on myself, really self-critical, um, really, just really hard on myself, not showing myself a lot of like self-love and whatnot. So this paradigm shift where it, it, it what it came to, honestly, it's about three years ago when I had my, you know, it's almost like a midlife crisis when I decided to move back from the U.S. back to Canada. It's almost like I stopped looking at the, it was for like for the first time, I, I, it was like I felt like I'd reached the midpoint of my life. And if, if any of you have um, reached the midpoint of your life where you feel like, okay, so it's just like you, at, at some point you start to look back and take, it, take account more than you did in your youth and when you were younger. And that is the paradigm shift that, I, that I've been going through over the last three years. Really now focusing on the next 40 years versus just constantly drive, 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 drive. What's next for me? Um, and, and the pursuit of all sorts of different goals and whatnot to now, okay, whew, half of my life is over. What do I want the last half of my life to look like? And how do I reverse engineer that? And that forced me to take a bigger, bigger picture look at the whole package of who is this guy? What does he stand for? Why was he even born? And just reassess everything. Exciting. I love it. Danny thinks that's awesome. I think that's good. <laughs> that's good stuff. So what is the, um, and by the way, so few people actually do that because that takes a shitload of work. You know what I mean? And that's super uncomfortable to do. But whenever you do that, the, like what's on the other side of that is, right, is that, is that freedom, man. That's amazing. Um, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of gratitude? Gratitude is the antidote to anxiety. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Um, it's how I personally manage my anxiety whenever I feel anxious. Um, if I wake up and I can't fall asleep because I'm anxious, my mind is going immediately pivot to what can I be grateful for it right here, right now, immediately, even if it's like two in the morning and you, you know, I, I wake up um, and uh, you know, your mind is going or whatever could be it or at any point during the day, what comes to me? Yeah. I, I would definitely say what comes to me is the gratitude is, is the most, lethal secret weapon i think that any of any of us can have in our toolbox it's the most lethal secret we weapon to slay uh negative thoughts anxiety uh things of that nature so to me i see i see gratitude as as, as a tool more than a tool uh, like a weapon actually that you can use for good agree with that 100 percent. and we talk about on this call a lot you know you can't be fearful and grateful same time right you can't be anxious and grateful at the same time like if you are truly in gratitude all that other stuff goes away man um yeah and, and you know what it is it's because gratitude forces you like when you go into a place of gratitude and even if it's as, as minor as like I'm, I'm grateful for this clean t-shirt that i was able to put on this morning like and just take a take a minute to like look at it and be like the fact that I have a clean shirt to put on today is something to be grateful for because there are so many people that don't have that. There are so many people. And, and, and that's, that's like a really basic sort of a elemental thing, like having a clean shirt to put on. But if, if you take it for granted every single day, um, I mean, there, there are literally billions of people who live on you know, less than a dollar a day. Like a clean shirt isn't even a once in a lifetime thing. Right. So by, by being grateful for something that simple, that that basic, or if I roll over in my bed uh, and and I just I feel the soft pillow or smell the clean sheets and just be just you know, breathe a sigh of gratitude for for that, uh, for your health, for the you know, warm cup of you know, mug of tea that you have or what it does is it brings you into the present. 
And by bringing yourself and bringing your mind into the present, you're, you're taking it out, you're getting out of your head. And the thing that is ruminating in your head that's giving you anxiety, it dissipates. It's just a way of, of, of grounding. So that's why it's, it's, it's so powerful. And there's a lot of science and a lot of research on it as well on how you know, gratitude is such a powerful, it's such a, such a powerful practice. Love it. Absolutely agree with all that, man. I was, let um, me tell you your shirt, I was in a meeting last week and this guy was sharing about how he was grateful that his socks didn't smell and he wasn't embarrassed sitting in that meeting. Like he had on clean socks today, you know what I mean? And uh, sometimes when I do the laundry, all my socks match because I'm OCD and I don't want to fuck with it, right? Like I, they all match. So it doesn't matter what I do, they just go together. And I'm grateful for that. And then I'm thinking this, you know, people always take it to the next level. If you look for something to be grateful for, um, we can always find that, right? So I love the analogy, man. I couldn't agree more. Mm. So yeah, my socks used to be matched as well until uh, my, uh, my son, my uh, teenage son came uh, last summer to live with me. And uh, ever since... <laughs> Every day, it's a battle to find a pair of matching socks now. And it used to like so annoying me because he'll just, he'll, you know, he just, um, yeah, he'll just put them on, he gets them all mixed up and then they go in through, through the washing or through the laundry and then they come out and it's like, you can't find, find the matches. And it's like, but um, small, small first world problems that we get to, to deal with. Right. So the next time you don't find matching socks, you'd be like, at least they're clean, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So one, um, w- one of my top 10 values is ownership. And something I've heard you say several times, you know, is radical personal responsibility. And I'm just curious, like, when was that something that became like a realization for you that you started implementing in your life to change? Yeah, so that... That was something I started working on, shifting my mindset um, to taking full responsibility, radical responsibility for my circumstances when I was still on the commune, when I was still on this farm where I where I grew up. Um, the 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 motivation for that came from me um, wanting to leave behind the victim. Uh, there were the person who was a victim of those circumstances. And because you can't change the past, you can't change the family that you were born into. You can't change the, um, the a lot of the circumstances that, that we're born into and that we grew up with the conditioning, the, a lot of the experiences of our childhood and whatnot. You can't, we, we have, when we're minors, we have very little, very little control. Uh, over those. And a lot of things happen to us that are not necessarily our, our choice. Like I didn't choose to be born. My parents chose to have me, right? So this notion of radical personal responsibility is one where you seek to take responsibility for every thing in your life, whether you created it or not, whether you caused it to happen or not. Um, by that's taking responsibility for everything. And I mean, everything, uh, it's the, it's the easiest way. It's not, it's okay. It's not easy. It's, it's the most powerful way, uh, most effective way to make, um, to make the best of it. So what I mean by that is when you take full and radical responsibility for stuff, that's not even your, your fault. It's kind of like being in a place of gratitude. When you're, when you're in a place of ownership, you can't also be a victim. And the secret to breaking patterns of victimology, so you don't, com- or any, any limiting belief patterns that, that, that might be keeping you stuck, or if you feel like you're, you're drifting or you're repeating the same thing over and over, whether it's in a relationship or whether it's, it's to do with money or to do with business, Whatever, when we repeat something as a pattern, um, it's because we are victim to or um, 
we were a victim to a set of circumstances that conditioned us that way. So by owning those circumstances and by owning them and say, and, and looking inward versus throwing your hands up and saying, well, I can't do anything about it. That's what happened. Well, it's not, it's not my fault. Um, it, it shifts you out of victim mindset and into victor mindset where you're an overcomer. And the two together, taking responsibility and then being grateful for the opportunity to grow as uncomfortable as it might be, is what makes up growth mindset. And growth mindset is, is to me, the secret. Like over the last three years, I would say, and this also led to, um, you know, where I am right now, um, evaluating and um, and determining, you know, what determines my self-worth and determines my self-esteem is no longer the outside or the material things or my accomplishments or my ego or what my ego wants, but how much, how much have I grown? And the more, and, and by attaching your self-esteem to your growth versus your results, all of a sudden you take this pressure off of you to be someone uh, that, you know, to, 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 be, to, to be someone other than who you, who you actually are. And it's very, very liberating. Very, uh, yeah, very liberating. So I'd say the two, you know, gratitude and personal responsibility really go hand in hand. Then. I, love it. I agree. Yeah, it might not be my fault, but it's my responsibility to, to do something about it. Absolutely. Yeah, and if you, if you take the word responsibility and break it in half, response, ability, ability to respond, it's... That's the way I think of it versus the traditional definition of responsibility is like, who's, who, who, well, fault. Yeah. <laughs> Whose fault is it? I mean, that's the way we yeah. associate it, even though it's, that's not the full definition of, of responsibility. Like I, I can be responsible for something that's not my fault. That's right. Absolutely. And that's a mindset shift, man. And I think that that's hopefully becoming a, a more popular thing. Right, take taking ownership and taking responsibility, right, and not not pointing fingers. But it, that's one of the things I love about this community. You know what I mean? It's it's my second biggest pet peeve is victim mentality. Can't stand it, right? And uh, I think that fortunately we're surrounded by people, and you guys have created a culture here to where it's uh, people take responsibility for their own results. You know, and that's that's what it's about, man. I believe. So this one not quite as deep. Because, you know, deep questions. I've seen pictures of you cooking, right? And the food looks amazing. I have no idea how it tastes. I'd have to ask Steph if it's, if it's actually good, but the pictures look great. So, like, what is your favorite meal to cook? Hmm. Yeah, cooking is one of these things that I, I love to do because it's, it's a way for me to express uh, love. I, I grew up with all home cooking, uh, rarely, well, practically never, maybe once a month or not even that, maybe every few months we'd have a takeout or fast food, but we grew up on, everything was homegrown, homemade, home cooked. And it was what, it was, it was the way, and my mom put a lot of love into everything that she made. Like you, if you're making a piece of toast, it, and applying the butter that it's applied evenly i mean everything was done with love you put love into love into it so when i um w when i cook it's like that's my way of loving my kids it's my way of loving the people that are are going to receive it i want the presentation to be nice i want the flavors to be nice i want everything to be just just perfect and uh you know i do have this perfectionist side of me this ocd side of me as well that you know, I have to really battle sometimes to, to keep at bay because he wants that, that part of me wants to go into full blown chef mode. Uh, and just, you know, everything has to be perfect. And then all of a sudden, instead of a quick, um, meal prep, it's like a three hour ordeal and it's like nine or 10 o'clock at night before dinner is ready. And then Steph is like, she's like, I can't eat this late. Like what's going on. So, um, you know, it's been an, the cook, cooking, believe it or not, has been a, 
has been a, especially over the last year during the pan pandemic, I've cooked more in the last year than I've cooked in the previous X number of years. I don't even know. But um, we cook, you know, most nights, cook dinner. And we actually get, um, we subscribe to one of these meal kit services where they, they deliver a, a huge box uh, and everything is portioned out. And we get three, three meals. Uh, and there's usually enough for leftovers as well. And it's kind of like building Lego. You just follow the instructions. So that's been quite liberating for me as well because I'm, I'm able to just follow the instructions. It's relatively straightforward. I don't have to, you know, I don't have to get all creative and it gets me out of chef mode and I get to just cook the damn meal the way it's supposed to be cooked. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I've really got, I've really enjoyed getting into to those um, to cooking those, but in terms of like, what is my favorite thing to cook? Gosh, I, I don't know that I have a favorite thing to cook. Um, I, I was actually, one of the, one of the things that makes me the happiest to cook is to make, it's not really cooking, but to make a really nice sandwich, um, mm. either for myself or, or my kids. Um, now I don't really eat bread too much anymore but um i mean i used to every you know on the weekends i always cook like a blt sandwich for my kids and just really enjoy the you know the different flavors and textures and 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 um you know the presentation and just something about the salty bacon that goes with the you know, with the egg and just um yeah and uh, and then I, I went for a bunch of years if you followed me on instagram um where I would make burgers and that burgers were kind of my thing. And the Casa Cuba burger was like a hashtag people would hashtag and people would, people started requesting them and be like, Hey, can we come to your place and have one of your burgers? Uh, because I'd post pictures of these, uh, these really um, delicious burgers that um, I used to cook, used to eat a lot of burgers, but I also used to weigh about 15 pounds more than I weigh now yeah. too. So I honestly don't cook uh, burgers that often anymore, but I really enjoyed uh, cooking those. Uh, actually, you know what? I do have a favorite thing to cook and it's ribs, even though I don't really eat ribs too much anymore, but like making a, a rack of ribs um, on the grill and all afternoon sort of an ordeal or an all day sort of an ordeal with some beers in the backyard. Yeah, I'd say that's probably my favorite. So yeah, actually I do have a, I do have a favorite, I guess, I guess you could say. And those are always a hit too. The kids love them and people love them. Everybody loves ribs, man. I love, I like to cook too, man. So uh, yeah, I started, I don't, I, I'm kind of allergic to social media, so I don't spend a lot of time on there, but I remember when the pandemic hit, uh, I was scrolling more and I was seeing all these different meals that you were putting out. So I'm with you, man. What brings you the most peace and serenity? What brings me the most peace and serenity? Ooh, it's a good one. Um, well, the activity that brings me the most peace and serenity would be going on a walk with the dogs and the staff. Something that we do religiously, daily. Um, that's one thing. I, I don't, I'm just going to spout off a couple if you don't know a few yeah. and then yeah. just like the cooking thing, there might be a most one, but I have to, I'd have to think through it. So I'm also think out loud if I'm going to have to think through it. So well, there, right. there's that. Um, my, uh, in my morning practice, I do these breathing exercises where, um, uh, you know, different types of breathing and, and, and exercises and meditations. And, uh, I mean, that's a pretty surefire way to get into a state of, it's a very reliable and consistent way of, of, of using your physiology to get your mental state into a place of calm and peace and, um, and, and, and presence. So that's, it's, it's one of my favorite things to do if I'm not feeling present, it's like on demand, I can be there in you know, 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, small, relatively small investment. Um, listening to music, especially vinyl, with friends or family, um, 
that's something that I really enjoy. Um, and, and really, um, I guess snowboarding with my kids, <laughs> just being out in nature, going really fast, the adrenaline, the fresh air, the scenery, the, the time away from, from work and responsibility, and we can just, we can just have fun. Uh, I would say, yeah. So I would say those are those are some of the top, the top nice. things that bring me uh, peace and serenity. I like how you reference, you know, being able to to get there on demand, like with with your breathing practice, right, and the meditation and all that. And I'm, I'm a huge believer, you know, that a, a bad moment doesn't have to make a bad day, you know. And I think that like we could start over at any time. Like we just have to make the choice to do it, set aside a little bit of time, and we can completely start over. And that's been a, that's been a game changer for me especially since working from home, you know, mm. um, I love it. Mm. What, um, what advice would you give um, for people not to take on others doubt, right? Because whenever you, you start something different, there's a lot of doubt, you know, and I believe that a lot of times people, they just do it because they care about us and it's their own limitations that they're placing on us, right? Um but, you know, that doubt, I've, it's been my experience. I've seen it and I'm sure I've done it. Uh, we'll be taking on that doubt of other people for ourselves. Like, what advice would you give against that? And they've been doing this for a minute. Yeah, so doubt, um, uh, which is a, a fear-based, you know, or fear, it's on the fear end of the spectrum energy. Uh, it's very contagious. It's an energy thing that you can feel. You can feel it without even using words, just by if somebody doubts you or questions you um, enough, that can come across just their energy, their vibe, whatever you want to call it. So it, it, it's something that has a huge effect um, potentially on us. So I'd say the first step is to just be conscious and aware that other people's emotions and thoughts and beliefs that are projected on us do affect us if we are not really vigilant and really cognizant of of it. So just, I would say the first that the first piece of advice would be to bring bringing awareness to it. So, for example, um, someone might not support you in what you're doing. Um, but you, but they may not say it. It may come across in a passive aggressive way or somehow in a way where they're not supporting you, but they, they may not, not actually be verbalizing it. Sometimes it's actually easier if they do verbalize it because then, then you can actually have a conversation around it. But bringing awareness, just bringing awareness to the fact that other people's energies, the collective energy of the people in our circles of influence, ultimately, in a symbiotic way, influence us disproportionately. Like we, we don't operate in a vacuum. So that's why it's so powerful to put yourself into groups like this, where there are like-minded people on a similar path to support that side of you. So you've got, but it starts with awareness that, that it's actually a thing. And, and by bringing awareness to it, you can then, you can then make, make choices. And the other thing is what, what I've found to be very helpful is to not blame or judge or um, resent people for doubting you. If someone doubts you and someone's worried about you and somebody genuinely cares about it, but it's because they genuinely care about you, it's a different story if they're jealous, um, which can be the case sometimes or a lot of times can be if they're jealous, but if they genuinely are concerned for you, be, be grateful that they are genuinely concerned and hear them out and, and listen to try to understand what their concern is. It doesn't have to change anything, but just by letting them express what their doubts, what their concerns, what their worries are, you can, it, can, it, it can give them an outlet that dissipates that tension or that energy. And they can stop, you know, maybe maybe stop projecting it on you. Um, 
but yeah, it's, it's, it's something that you've got to bring awareness to. And then at the same time, know why you are doing what you're doing. Know deep down inside whether, whether or not, like whether or not you have the conviction or the commitment to, to be on the path that you're on. So if you're on a, on, on a, if you're committed to being on a path of personal growth and the path to self-discovery and the path to self-reliance and the path to creating independence, not just for yourself, but for, for other people as well, if you're committed to being on that path and you know why you're on that path, not a lot will dissuade you. It doesn't mean that you won't ever change your mind or shift gears or shift, um, you know, shift, shift, you know, shift what you focus on, but it'll always be in, you know, from the mindset of growth and what's the next best thing and what's the next best step in the direction to, that will take me in the direction that I want to go. In Incubate, um, we just finished the first round of Incubate, the next round of the Incubate masterclasses or mastermind starting in June. And uh, we talk a lot about this, about defining your direction. Yes, you want to have a destination in mind that you're working towards, but life is mostly about defining what direction you're going to go and sticking with that. Because if you're constantly changing direction based off of everyone's whim or everyone's opinion or what other people think or say, or whether somebody, whether enough people support you or not, you're you're kind of like a, a ship without a rudder. Um, you get, you, you'll have the sail, so the wind can, can move you, but you can't actually, you're, you, you've, without a sense of direction, there's no inner peace. There's no possibility for, for inner peace. We have to be, we, ha we have to know in our hearts and feel in our hearts that we're doing something meaningful that is, that is the, the right thing for us to be doing. So having that conviction and, and that knowing and that clear sense of that clear sense of purpose, that clear sense of direction is that is the safeguard from getting distracted, the safeguard from, you know, from letting negative thoughts or emotions or opinions affect you. So it's a, I'd say it's a combination of both things. Great answer, man. Uh, and I relate to, you know, I love when you talked about the people who love you, you know, be, be grateful you know, for, for that, like, because they're, 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 the doubt might necessarily just be their concern for us. You know what I mean? And it, if somebody's for the people who love us, not the haters, but it takes a lot of courage sometimes to, to voice that for them, you know? So I think that how we receive it can really play a role in, on how it affects us. Right. And with, with our commitment, right. When we're going forward, like I relate this to like, when I got clean, uh, it's not real spiritual, but you know, my mantra was motivate me, support me, or get the fuck out of my way. Cause this is where I'm going, you know, and the people who love you and the people that carry you and support you, they're on board, whether they agree with you or not, they support you. Right. And then the people that doubt or whatever, then, you know, they end up falling by the wayside. You know, that's been my experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what is, uh, what's the best Wi-Fi name that you can remember seeing? That's Wi Fi name that I can remember seeing. Gosh, I have no idea. Um, actually, there was one that I saw. There's one that I saw the other day, actually. Yeah, let me just look, see if it's here. I'm trying to remember what it is because there's a whole bunch that come up. Um, it was like, this is not your. This is <laughs> not, not your, your network. Life. Yeah. <laughs> not your Wi-Fi or something like that. Um, I'm not seeing it now. Yeah, I don't know. One of my neighbors, um, something like that. I know that's, that's not very, I mean, but what's, the, let me turn that around on you. What's the, what's the most interesting or peculiar or unique one that you've seen? The, the funniest one that jumps out to me, um, when I did medical sales, we had these medic conventions and there was this, mm. this, and so of course in the convention hall, you know, people would pay for Wi-Fi. And um, there was this one company called Global Medical Imaging (GMI), uh, and somebody named their their Wi-Fi GMI sucks. And uh, 
and they all came in. Everybody in the hall, I mean, there's thousands of people there. Everybody in there saw it. And they, and they assumed I did it, uh, which I didn't because I would own it. But that was hilarious. I wish I would have thought of it. But to me, anytime I see a crazy Wi-Fi name, I always go back to that, man. I just thought that was so clever. You know? <laughs> I still don't know who did it. What is... Um, What's some of the, some some of the and I don't want to like the best or the most, but like what's some great advice that you've received? Great advice that I've received. Um, this is go. This would go back to my mentor that I referred to earlier. Uh, who through from the age of uh, 19 to 24 mentored me. I received a lot of great advice uh, from him. But one of the things that really stands out is actually right along the lines of what we just talked about with, you know, how do you deal with other people's negative thoughts or beliefs? Uh, and how do you like not to let them affect you? And it was, it was actually to do with that. Um, so as he was helping me, psychologically prepare to make this shift to move off of this commune. Psychologically uh, and emotionally, it was a huge, huge and very traumatic undertaking because I had no reference points on the outside. I had no bank account, I had no credit score. I didn't have any friends and every family knew nothing about pop culture, um, books, movies, music, all of that. So it's this fear of being a Martian, like go, like leaving this, this safe confines of this commune. Um, and um, integrating into the real world was absolutely, it was a terrifying, terrifying thought. And to do it, I had to have a lot of conviction that it was the right thing for me to do. And what he, the best advice that he gave me, I would say is don't expect, you don't need people to agree with you. If you know it's right for you to do, it's the right thing for you to do. You don't, and you shouldn't even expect them to agree with you, let alone encourage or support you because it would, it, in order to do that, they would have to question their own identity, their own beliefs as to why they are there, and why they are staying there. So I would say that's that's probably the biggest advice is that he gave me is to just, and because because growing up in that that situation, the need for validation to fit in was a huge part of my identity, and, and to this day it's, it's something that I've got to work on. It's like I uh, a lot of concern about what other people think, and. Um, his advice rings true to this day. Know who you are, uh, know what you want, and don't expect everyone to support it. And just by, and by not expecting everyone to support it, you give them permission to just disagree with you. And it doesn't have to reflect on you. Uh, the second piece, biggest piece of advice I would say he gave me was to when communicating or trying to articulate something or trying to make your point or trying to convince someone or trying to sell someone or trying to explain yourself to meet the person, the other person where they are at, to try to see it through their lens, through their perspective, have a dual perspective, try to understand where they're coming from and meet them, meet them there versus shutting down, uh, getting defensive, and talking over the other person um, by listening, being empathetic, having a dual perspective, and listening through um, and genuinely wanting to understand that why they are upset. Um, you can you can just you can bring resolution to almost any disagreement. And then I would say a third thing from him. You asked for. I'll give you, these are the top three that come to mind anyway. Um, is the, the, the top three best piece of advice would be less is more. Try to say, try to get your point across. Try to um, 
try to use as few words as possible. Anything that's fluff or that, that can be stripped away, uh, you should consciously try to strip it away. In other words, uh, I'll always try to be as direct and as, as, as um, yeah, be, be, as, be as direct. Well, that's not really the, simplicity sells, I think is how he, how we put it, simplicity sells. Um, that's, it, it takes effort, but in your marketing, um, really in, in, in your communicate, any form of communication, you're building a business or a brand, um, keep in the back of your mind that simplicity sells and confusion causes indecision. So even the way you structure your sentences, so on and so forth. And it's something that I, I used to actually be better at, where there was a time in my life where I was actually really good at it. But now that you've just asked me this question, I think I got myself thinking like, you know what, I could probably say more with, with less. <laughs> um, we, we can all say more with less. So those are, those are a few pieces of advice from one of the most influential mentors in, in my life. Love it. That's excellent. We had, we had Caroline Antonio on um, last last time, and I work with her. She helps me a lot with content. That's something she she tells me to remove the words and you know be more specific uh, in, in the marketing. In my personal life, I'm pretty direct, but I have to I have to make it a point to be that way in other areas, man. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that with me too. In your opinion, what do a lot of people misunderstand about success? Um, hmm. I think it got actually go to, in my opinion, it goes back to what I said about uh, growth mindset. So if you have a growth mindset, you, you will experience success differently than if you have a fixed mindset. So for example, if you have a fixed mindset, and you set a goal to achieve a certain monetary benchmark, let's just say, uh, in your business or some material goal. If you attach your definition of, to, of success to the achievement of that goal, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. And, and you know, it, in, in some ways you'd be kind of crazy not to have set goals that you, that you define. It's like, I will be successful um, that, you know, that, that would make me more successful if I achieved that goal. But the feeling of success needs to be derived from, needs to come from your growth and your progress and not the result. And to me, that's the biggest thing I, I feel, because otherwise you'll never feel, you'll never really feel successful because no matter what goal you achieve, no matter what, no matter what the outcome is, it won't be enough. And within a few minutes or days or months of, of achieving that goal, you won't feel successful anymore because you'll have this, this feeling like I've got, now I've got to go and do it all over again. And what now? What next? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? And it we, we becomes this, this pursuit of material, this pursuit of things outside of ourselves versus success really, in my opinion, should be a way of being. If you are able to solve your problems and grow on a daily daily basis and, and do something that is meaningful and rewarding to you, that is success. And you are successful if you are able to live in that way. And if you can attach your self-esteem and your self-worth to your growth and not so much to the outcomes, you will start to celebrate the smaller things, the smaller wins, and the the... The, the steps along the way that need to be taken, you can enjoy the process. You can enjoy the journey versus waiting for the destination or waiting for the end result to manifest. And then that, that feeling of success being, you know, so, so finite and so limited and so fleeting as well. So I would say that's, that's definitely, from my opinion, um, 
that, that's what, what a lot of people, uh, a lot of people struggle with. And if there's one thing I could give, give folks, and it's, and it's something that took me many, many years to achieve as well, because for many years, Danny, no matter what I achieved, I didn't feel any more successful. I did temporarily for a fleeting moment after the, after that goal was achieved, but then there would inevitably come this crash and it was anticlimactic. It's like, oh, now I've got to do that all over again. What if I can't do it all over again up to that same standard? Does that mean I'm no longer successful? And our identity, if our identity becomes wrapped up in the end results, man, we are going to struggle with our self-worth. Love it. Agree, man. A thousand percent on that. You know, we, uh, we talk on here a lot about, you know, the way we build self-confidence is by making and keeping commitments to ourselves. You know what I mean? I believe that if we, if we make commitments to ourselves and we keep them no matter how small, even if it's making your bed, whatever it is, right? Like if we're living in that moment of making these and achieving these, then we feel successful regardless, right? Because we believe that we can do things because we have this self-confidence. You know, I, I relate to that. So, I mean, I have got so many more questions and we're short on time. I want to respect your time. So I'm going to pick a couple out of here. So if you could create one law in the universe that everyone had to follow, what would it be? One law in the universe that everyone had to follow. Kindness. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Treat people with love and respect. Um, I think if there was more kindness, the world would be a, such a better place. Um, that would preclude a lot of bad things from happening. Word. Could not agree more. All right. Finish this statement. Vulnerability is... Vulnerability is empowering. True. What is something that would surprise people to know about you? I, I do have to say though, it's empowering if it's done. Uh, it, vulnerability is empowering if it's done with the with a healthy intent. There, there's also. Uh, a form of narcissism, which is based on vulnerability as well, um, which is attached to victimology. And I wouldn't say that's empowering. <laughs> so no, um, that's like in general, seeking, right? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, what was your next question? Um, what is something that would surprise people to know about you? Uh, hmm. I used to work for Snoop Dogg. Yes, I know that. That is an <laughs> awesome fact, man. <laughs> it was one of my first jobs, actually, after I left the farm, the commune. I went on tour. I got to go on tour, and uh, I was like a roadie for uh, close to a year. Um, different bands. And, and Snoop Dogg, I was on a tour with them for uh, six or eight weeks, something like that. And uh, that was very eye-opening experience for me coming as this kid off of the farm, no outside world experience, didn't even know who Snoop Dogg was, to oh. getting to travel all over North America, seeing all of the, all of the major cities, most of the major cities, and just that, that experience I'll never forget. It's culture shock, man. What a, what, a, what a life experience, even if he did not come from a commune, right? Yeah, so exactly. I, I, I asked, I asked people, uh, this is, this is one of the questions I had to ask everybody is, um, so, you know, since you've been in this space, what is the thing that you believe holds most people back from reaching their goals? The thing that's the most common. Doubt and fear. Um, fear of, uh, fear and limiting beliefs, really. Um, if we take our beliefs from the past and we project them onto our future, even though we might be trying to ride a different bicycle or try, trying to go down a different path, our limiting beliefs, uh, they go with us. 
and our limiting beliefs are what keep us ultimately stuck. So we try all sorts of different things. Uh, we get shiny object syndrome where we're you know, looking for the next best or the next easiest or looking for the, uh, you know, the next shortcut, the next shortcut. But in reality, oftentimes what's, um, what's, what's holding us back is that we're just running old patterns from the past and thinking that we're going to get a different result from the future. So whether we want to or not, exploring those limiting beliefs and and growing out of them, we really have no choice. We have we really have no choice because consciously or unconsciously, they will they will determine and dictate the level to which we rise in the future. I love it. It's the most common answer, belief, you know, I believe. Um, all right, so I have one more question, but before I ask you, man, I just, I'm sure you've got something right, right after our, right after this call here, man, but I just wanted to, want to say thank you for, for taking the time to, to come hang out with us, man. The first time, um, first time that I met you was in Toronto and, you know, you didn't, you didn't know me from Adam and I just walked up and said, Hey man, I'd love to interview you. And then you were like, okay, sure. You know? Uh, and you did. And when I went to track you down, man, you were actually looking for me to, to keep your word, right. To, to let me do that. And you had no idea what I was going to ask you kind of like today. Um, and I just appreciated that. And then that night when, when we all had dinner, a bunch of us, and I told that story, um, about recovery, I don't know if you remember this, but you walked up to me after that and you hugged me and said, you need to tell that story every day and whatever you do, don't change you know, like who you are and always be yourself. That was, that was the advice you gave me, which, you know, whenever you said that was advice your mentor gave to you, but um, the very first call that we did here, I opened it with that story. And, uh, and that was powerful mm. for me, man. I really, I really appreciate that. That's something that stuck with me. And, um, and then the next day at, at momentum day, um, I got to see for the first time, you weren't at my first event in London uh, and I forgive you, but in Toronto, you know, you were there all day. It's like you guys were Elvis, you know what I mean? Like you and, and Stuart and, and Justin, all that. And you made the time to talk to everybody. You were there late as fuck. I remember hugging you goodbye and it was like late, late, man. And you were giving the person in front of you the same attention that you did the first person that day. Um, and that says a lot about you as a person, man. So I'm, I'm grateful to be here with you and I appreciate uh, you making the time. So thank you very much, man and uh you have the one pleasure, more question the, the pleasure is mine thank you danny appreciate that absolutely man um this one and this is a serious question so of all the people who live in florida who are named danny who have interviewed you who's the best uh you, you you're definitely the best danny <laughs> there's no there's just no comparison appreciate it um, <laughs> love man love thank you all right, I'll wrap this up here. At the end, we always do, uh, if it's your first time with us, we always do action items because it's not just about coming and talking. It's about actually doing shit. Um, the first action item we have, it's the same every time. This is what Curls does when I cuss. Um, the first action item that we do every time uh, is to go tell somebody that you appreciate them. You know, don't, don't text them or email them. Like, pick up the phone, call them, tell them in person. Send them a voice note, just tell somebody that you appreciate them. Um, second one that's different uh, this week is to sit with someone, somebody who's older, preferably, uh, and just ask them a question about their past and just listen to them. You know, I got to sit with mom for a little while last weekend, and uh, she just wanted to tell me like about her childhood, and I just sat there patiently and listened, and it meant the world to her, and I actually learned some stuff. So I know we think we're busy. But, you know, if we're blessed to have full lives, we can take a little bit of time out and give it to some, some folks. If your parents aren't around, I'm old. You can call and ask me. I'll tell you a story. And the book of the week. I've read three books since our last call, and the other two are more, like, businessy-like. But this book keeps resonating with me. So this is the book that I'm going to recommend as our book of the week for a call that's every two weeks is Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. This book is awesome. It's not about like acting or Hollywood or that kind of stuff, but this is a killer book, man. He's got some good life advice, 
Um, plus, he's just a cool dude. So that's my book of the week. Jay Kubasek, you are a That one's rock on the list. Star. Dude, it's a, it is a really, really good book, man. I mean, we're like that. It's, it's, a, it's a good book, and there's some good stuff in it. So highly recommend nice. it. Curls, thank you for being amazing and for making all of this work, because we all know that without you, there would be none of this. I would still be trying to let people in an hour later. So thank <laughs> you. You're a blessing, and you're amazing. I appreciate you. It's always a pleasure. And uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining this call. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, there was certainly a lot of wisdom shared here, and I know I will see some of those quotes in your post um, on the show social groups very soon. So thank you, Jay. You're an absolute star. Absolutely love you. Oh, and, thank uh, you. Yeah, it was really, really good to have you here. Uh, we haven't seen each other in a long time, so I was very excited to have you on one of our calls with our cool kids. This is how they call themselves here. So yeah, good to have you here. Danny, thank you for your time and for everything you do for this community as usual. Very grateful. Oh, thank you. I appreciate y'all taking some time out of your day to come hang out with the cool kids, man. We enjoyed it. <laughs> well, that's a wrap, ladies and gentlemen. And we'll see you in two weeks time. And the interview will be with Cordelia Kate. So make sure you join us. And um, if you want to learn more about how the incubate works and what you can gain from this experience, don't forget to register for uh, the call that Jay will have on the community very soon. Having said that. Thank you everyone. Thank you for having me. Thanks Jay. Thanks.